We're ready to start our next big uh, topic of this course, which is linear maps. They're also uh, called linear uh, transformations. Same thing. And the first thing I want to do is write the definition, then we're going to discuss it a bit and understand it, then we're going to list some examples, and uh, then proceed with the theory. So here's first the definition. So far, everything we did, we always worked in the context of a specific vector space. The vector space was sometimes just Rn, n tuples, thought of as row vectors or column vectors. Sometimes the space was a space of matrices, sometimes a space of polynomials, but always a single vector space. All the guys were taking from a single vector space. Okay. And what may be interesting, and is interesting, whenever you have a notion in mathematics, this is really a, a general uh, uh, approach in mathematics, whenever you have a, a notion, for example, vector spaces, the next thing you would be interested in is functions of, those, of that notion. So what are functions between vector spaces? Okay. Functions from one vector space to another vector space. Okay. And a function in general, you know that from calculus, a function in general is just a rule that tells you to every element in the, in the domain what the element in the range to which, what is the element in the range to which it, it maps, right? A unique element in the range, okay? But whenever we're talking of maps or functions or transformations which relate to specific, to specific structures, we want those maps to preserve the structure, okay? So the idea is a map between two vector space, a map, from v1 to v2, we would want it, for example, if we add two guys in v1, a plus b, and then transform, we would want to get the same result as if we first transform and then add in v2. If we take a vector here and multiply it by 5 and then send it, we want to get the same result as if we send it and then multiply it by 5. Okay? We want the map to respect the structure, the underlying structure. The underlying structure in terms of vector spaces is not much. There's addition and there's scalar multiplication. We want the functions to respect addition and scalar multiplication. That's it. That's a linear map. So let's write that. Let V1 and V2 B, two vector spaces, they do have one thing in common in order for everything to compile. They have to be over the same field. They have to, to obey the same set of scalars, okay? Over some field F, the same F for both, okay? A function, what a function is, you know, a function, but we're going to usually denote our functions with t, t for transformations, rather than f like in calculus, t from v1 to v2, a function t from v1 to v2 is called a linear function or a linear map or a linear transformation if it satisfies two things. One, if you take two little guys in V1, two vectors, U and V, add them and then apply the function you get the same thing as apply the function to one, apply the function to the other, and then add t of u plus t of e. That's the first rule. OK? 
Okay. Note that on the board right now, I have this little cross here and this little cross here. They're both plus signs, but they're very different. This is the addition in V1. Here I'm adding two guys from V1. This is the addition in V2. I'm adding T of U and T of V, which are elements in V2. Do you see that? I'm writing the same plus, but in fact those are two different operations. They live in two separate worlds. Good? The second property is respecting scalar multiplication. If you take T of alpha V, so alpha V is a scalar product of a vector in V1, and then do T to it, send it to V2, you get the same thing as do T to V itself, and then multiply that by alpha. This is scalar multiplication in V2. And since it's the same set of scalars, alpha is the same alpha in both. That works. Okay. So this is the definition of a linear map. I should just add here that this is true for any u, v, in v1, and for any alpha in f. Good? Okay. So the way to think of a linear map is as just a function. A function is just a rule sending guys from here to guys from there. Any rule. Okay. That satisfies these two properties, which means that it respects, it conserves the vector space structure, the linear space structure of the underlying V1 and V2. Okay, good? Let's do examples. So here are some examples. Example 1. So in order to give you an example, I need to tell you what V1 is, I need to tell you what V2 is, and I need to tell you what the map is, what T is. And then verify that it indeed satisfies those two properties. Okay, so here's the first example. V1 is going to be R3 of x. Do you remember what this notation stands for? Polynomial. Right, polynomials of degree less than or equal to 3 over r, with coefficients in r. Good? So that's going to be v1. And v2 is going to be r2 of x. Polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2. Okay, and we're going to define a map, a function, from V1 to V2. So in order to define it, I have to tell you what it does to a given polynomial of degree less than or equal to 3. So let's take a polynomial of degree less than or equal to 3. Let's call it, ready? Or polynomial. And what does T do to P of X? It simply takes P prime, the derivative. Everybody remember what the derivative is, even if you're not there yet in calculus, right? Good? Everybody? Okay. So, do you agree that the derivative of, pol of a polynomial is always of the degree, uh, of a lesser degree than the original polynomial, right? So if you had an x cubed here, its derivative is going to be an x squared, up to coefficients, right? So do you agree that it, this indeed goes from polynomials of degree less than or equal to 3 to polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2? Okay, now the question is, is it linear? So t is linear. Linear meaning it satisfies the two properties that we had in the definition. Why? So the first property was take two polynomials in R3, call them P of X and Q of X. Add them and then do T to the sum. What does do T mean? Do t means just take the derivative 
of whatever you had. P of x plus q of x prime, right? Now we know from calculus that the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, right? So this equals p prime of x plus q prime of x. This is true not just for polynomials, but for general functions, right? And this equals, what is p prime? p prime is t of p. And q prime is t of q. So this is t of p of x plus t of q of x. So t of a sum is the sum of the t's. That's the first property. Based on previous knowledge that the derivative is in fact a linear map. The derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. Good? Here's the second property. What, if, what is t of some scalar times a polynomial? It's the derivative of the scalar times the polynomial. That's what t does. It takes the derivative, right? Again, we know from our previous knowledge of the operation of taking the derivative in general for functions, that if you take three times a function and take the derivative, it's the same as three times the derivative, right? So this equals alpha times p prime of x, right? And this is precisely alpha times t of p of x. So the alpha hopped out of the t. So these two statements are satisfied, and therefore t is a linear map. The derivative acting on polynomials of degree 3, sending them to polynomials of degree 2, sorry, less than or equal to 3 to less than or equal to 2, is a linear map. It's not just a function, it's a linear function. Good? Okay. By the way, we're refraining from calling t a function, we're, although it is. It's a function between vector spaces, but we're calling it a map or a transformation Precisely for this reason, V could be a space of functions. So this is a space of functions, right? Polynomials are functions. T acts on functions. The input and the output are themselves function, functions. Do you see that? Okay, it's like one level up. The spaces are spaces of functions, and T is a function between functions. Okay, so that's why, at least terminology-wise, in order to keep things more, less confusing, we're calling t not a function, but a map. Good? Okay. Here, sure, yeah. Can we assume that t has no mathematical properties to it, such as it divides by 2 in one of the vector spaces? Like so you're asking, can we define different t's? Let me write some examples. We can do many, many t's. Okay, we can define various kinds of linear maps. We just have to check that, it, that they're linear. If you take a, a function and divide it by 2, that's a map. Okay, that taking a function and dividing it by 2 is a map. Is it linear? You have to verify. Okay, you have to verify these two properties. Sometimes it's straightforward, the verification. Sometimes you have to work. So we have to be given the exact, what is t, what does it do? Right? I don't understand the question. Because in this one, you, you said t is v1 to v2. That's no, right. no. This is the domain and the range of t. A function is comprised of three things. Yeah. Domain, range, and rule. This is the domain. This is the range. And this is the rule. Yeah. You have to give all three ingredients in order to specify a specific map or function. But we're not calling it a function. Okay? Domain, range, and rule. Good. Okay, good. Here's another example. Um, here's another example, example number two. Um, here, t is going to go from rn to rm. So these are just n tuples over the field r, but, but these are n tuples and these are m tuples. Vectors with n entries and vectors with m entries. 
And it's going to be defined as follows. I have to tell you what t does. Again, this is the domain, this is the range. Now I have to tell you what is the rule, right? So the rule is, tell me what t does to a vector. v is going to be a vector in Rn. I somehow have to produce a vector in Rm, OK? So here, it, what it, here is what t does. It multiplies v by a specific matrix A, where A a is a specific, a given um, m by n matrix. So if you give me a vector, suppose m is 3 and n is 2, if you give me a, a th and, and I, I fix in a 3 by 2 matrix, okay, if you give me a, ma a, a vector v, I multiply it by this matrix A, and I get a vector of length uh, 3. Or if, sorry, if, if, if n was 2, I get a vector of length 3. Okay? So, I want to argue that this is a linear transformation in general, and then I'm going to do an example of the example. So I'm going to take a specific A and show how it works. Okay, so this is a linear map. T is linear. How do I show that it's linear? So first, abstractly, okay? Fix A, why is T linear? Because I have to check the two properties. What is T of U plus V? T of U plus V is, by definition, what does T do? It multiplies U plus V by this matrix A, right? What do you get? Well, we know these are all matrices, right? A is m by n. These are vectors uh, uh, n by 1, right? So the multiplication is well defined, right? And we get an m by 1 vectors, but we know rules for matrix multiplication. This is the same as AU plus AV, right? We know that ma matrix multiplication in addition satisfy this distributivity. But what is AU? AU is precisely T of U. And AV is precisely T of V. Do you agree? And likewise, again, abstractly, take a vector, multiply it by a scalar. What does this specific T do? It takes A and multiplies it by this vector. And again, we know that the scalar can move freely among matrix multiplication. So this is the same as alpha times AV, right? And this is alpha times T of E. Good? So multiplying by a matrix is a linear transformation, okay? This is an example. This is example two. And in fact, there's going to be 2 sub A, which is going to be a concrete example, where I'm going to write a concrete matrix here. But in fact, in fact, this is not just an example. This is something completely general in the following sense. Any linear transformation between two vector space can be encoded in terms of a matrix, can be translated to multiplying by a matrix. Okay, so this is something we're going to discuss. It's going to have some details, and we're going to have to build up towards it. But this is a spoiler. Any linear transformation can be written in this form, okay? Between any two vector spaces, we're just going to have to translate from the original vector spaces to the coefficient uh, vectors. And then T is going to be encoded by a matrix. T is going to have a matrix representation, okay? Spoiler, this will show up later, but just keep it in mind. This is very general what we're doing here, okay? Okay, so let's do a concrete example. You, you, you can agree that there are millions of examples here, even without knowing what I just said. Take any matrix, you get a different example, okay? So let's call this example uh, 2 prime. An example of the example, 
So T is going to go from R2 to R3. And the way T is going to work on a vector in T is going to operate on a vector in R2. A vector is in R2 is something of the form XY. It's going to do, it's going to take the matrix 1, 2, 0, negative 1 and multiply it by X, Y. Sorry, this is not R3. This is R2 again. Sorry. Everybody fix this? Okay. So T goes from R2 to R2. The way T works is multiplying a vector in R2 by this specific matrix A. This is A in this example. Okay, so this is very concrete. Okay. So let's verify that this is indeed a linear transformation. Although we did it abstractly, let's do it more concretely so we can feel it, so we can see it with our own eyes. So what is T? So let's verify that T is indeed a linear map. So we need to, to check two things, namely the two properties of being a linear map. Here's the first one. We need to take T, okay, tell me if you agree to what I'm doing. I have to see what it does to X, Y plus, what did I call it, Z, W. That's T of a sum of two guys. Do you agree? Okay. So what is this? Well, now it's very concrete. It's this. So it's 1, 2, 0, negative 1. This is A times this vector. I know how to add in R2, right? This is just the vector x plus z, y plus w. Do you agree? Okay. And now I know how to do this multiplication. What do I get? I get x plus z plus 2 times y plus w. x plus z plus 2 times y plus w. Right? And the second component of the vector is going to be 0 times x plus z minus, so minus y plus w. This is what I get. Do you agree? Okay. What happens if I do t to the first one plus t to the second one? Let's see what we get there. t of x, y plus t of z, w. We better get the same thing, right? Let's see if we do. So what is t of x, y? It's 1, 2, 0, negative 1 times x, y plus 1, 2, 0, negative 1 times z, w. Do you agree? Good? So what do we get? We get x plus 2y, x plus 2y, and minus y, that's this, plus z plus 2w, and minus w. Do you agree? And obviously we know how to add vectors and this is the same as this. It's the same vector. Good? So these two are equal, therefore t of the sum is the same as the sum of the t's. That's the first property of being a linear map. Good? Okay, so this is equal to this. Good? The second property of being a linear map, let's take T of alpha xy. By the way, did you note that I made a slight abuse of notation, what's called? Okay, so I should have written T of another set of parentheses xy, right? This should have been written, this should have been written as T of 
the vector x, y. Right? But usually we, we don't write it like this and we just write this and this is called abusive notation. It should be this, but this is so much clearer that we just do it. Clear? Was that remark clear? Okay. But when we, when we have the alpha inside, we have to put the other pair of parentheses, so we get this. So what is T of alpha xy? It's taking the matrix, 1, 2, 0, negative 1. That's what T does. Multiply by the matrix. And multiply what? This vector. This is just the vector alpha x, alpha y, right? That's this vector. Good? And this equals, let's see what we get. We get alpha x plus 2 alpha y, that's the first component, and then 0 times alpha x minus alpha y. Do you agree? We could either multiply separately to find what is alpha t of x, y, but here, in fact, it's very easy to just pull the alpha out, right? So we can pull alpha out, and we're left with x plus 2y and negative y, right? And this we recognize, that's this. This was precisely t of x, y, right? So this equals t of x, y, that's this thing, multiplied by alpha. Good? Okay, so we just verified manually, although the, the abstract general statement said it very clearly, okay, we verified manually that this specific, specific matrix here, on specific N and M, indeed gives a linear transformation. So I know that at this point it's important to do this really with your hands to get the feeling, but I think it's also a good opportunity to make a certain remark, okay? You can see the power of abstractness here. Look how we worked, how we kind of wrote down all the details in order to verify that this very specific linear map is indeed a linear map, whereas and look on this board, it's just one example of a very general thing that looks very elegant to write down like this and includes any A you write here for any Rn and any Rm or Fn and Fm, the, the fact that it was R didn't play any role. And you can see the power of abstractness, right? You understand what I'm saying, the point I'm trying to make? This is... It, Abstractness has its, its merits, let's say. Okay? You, you have to re remember that when you start with something abstract, it may be too abstract, may be confusing, and you may need to strip it further into a very concrete example in order to really understand what's going on. But once you do understand it, it's, it's a very powerful tool. Good? Okay. So, um, I want to, uh, we're going to see many, many, many more examples, but gradually, because I want to gradually introduce more terminology and notions, and then each example is going to be yet another one, and, and going to exhibit one more notion or term, or so. But I do want to write now, um, I want to write a uh, very small theorem, very basic theorem, very easy theorem, and prove it, and a certain remark which we're going to discuss at length, but not right now, gradually. So, first of all, a remark So let's say this, suppose you take T of a vector, x, y, and define t of x, y to be, let's say, x, 1. This is a perfectly legitimate function, right? Going from R2 to R2. Do you agree? So this is a map t 
going from R2 to R2, for example. Okay? But this map is not linear. Okay? This is not, it's a map. Okay? It's a function. It's well defined. But this is not a linear. And you can try checking those two properties in C, and you'll see it right away, which fail. Okay, so this is not a linear map. And it raises the question, when I write something of this form, what do the components in the range have to satisfy in order for it to be a linear map? Okay, suppose I write here, for example, x0, would it be a linear map? Suppose I write x squared, why would it be a linear map? And so on. Okay? And the answer, the answer we're going to have is that the components each have to be linear combination of these com linear combinations of these components in order for it to be a linear map. Okay? So you can't have squares there, you can't have just standalone scalars there, but zero is good. Zero is a linear combination of x and y, right? x squared is not. 1 is not. Good? But we're going to see that later on. But you, you should practice this and try writing several things and seeing manually again to get the feeling that, that is very important when, you, when you're introduced to something new. To really touch it. To touch it. Okay? So write down several things like this and verify if they're linear maps or not. Until you get the feeling. Okay? Ah, uh, okay, and here's the theorem that I wanted to mention, a very, very basic one. Um, if t from v1 to v2 is a linear map, so if it does satisfy those two properties of being a linear map, then uh, two things hold. The first one is that t of 0 is always zero. And the second is that t of the additive inverse minus v is always minus t of v. Okay, let's prove this. Very short and immediate from the definition. So what we know, we know by the definition of a linear map, let's take a peek at the definition again. A linear map is just a map from V1 to V2. Look at this board, please. A map from V1 to V2 that satisfies two properties. And the only property we're going to need in this proof is property number two. That when you multiply by a scalar and do t, it's the same as doing t and then multiplying by the scalar. This is the property that we're going to use. Okay, so back here, we know by the definition, by definition, that t of alpha v equals alpha t of v. For any alpha and any v, right? So this is true for any alpha in f and for any v in v1, right? In the domain space, right? In particular, in particular, right, if we take alpha to be zero, it should still be true, because it's true for any alpha by definition. So if we take alpha to be zero, we get t of zero times v, t of zero times v, equals 0 times t of v. Do you agree? But 0 times v is what? The zero, the zero vector. So this is just t of 0. And 0 times anything is 0. So t of 0 is 0, and that proves a. Do you agree? And if alpha 
equals negative 1, another legitimate scalar in f, right? The inverse of the, the unit, every field has a, has a 1 in it, right? What do we get? We get t of negative v, negative 1 times v, which is just negative v. In fact, we even proved that, that negative 1 times v is minus v. I think we proved it at the very beginning when we started discussing vector spaces. Remember that? So t of minus v is minus 1 times t of v. Good? So that completes this proof. Okay. So these are not part of the definition, but they're as close as can be to being part of the definition. And we're going to use these facts freely in what's to come. Okay? The, any linear transformation always carries 0 to 0. That's a very easy, easy way, for example, of touching and seeing if a uh, map is a linear transformation or not. Here's an example. Is t of 0, 0, 0, 0? No. t of 0, 0 is 0, 1. That's it. It's not a linear transformation. It doesn't satisfy this. Do you see? Good? So this is a, a very tangible way of determining if a linear, a very easy way of determining right away if a linear transformation is linear or not. Okay? It's not an if and only if statement, but it's a way of, 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 of stating that a linear, that a map is not linear. Okay? Okay. So... We still, th this is just the introduction to what a linear transformation is. What we want to do next is define some more terms, some more notions, and then kind of write more examples and in them include already the new notions and discover what they are. So that's coming up next.